This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Okie dokie, folks. Welcome back. Horticulture's fell to rushing, and we're going to talk some gardening. I've been doing some gardening. I've been doing some gardening. This is my first summer in, who I don't know, 11 or 12 that I've been in Mississippi. Usually I'm over covering flower shows and stuff overseas, but uh, here it is, middle of August already. Uh, a couple of weeks from now, it's going to be September, and uh, soon after that, it's going to be the State Fair. What does that mean? What does it mean? Uh, today, when I was walking in, I happened to see some leaves falling off a tree, probably from drought. I don't know, because it has been really, really dry. But I picked a couple of them up as sweet gum leaves, and this one is bright yellow, bright, bright yellow. Uh, my first autumn falling leaf and uh it's gonna it's gonna get pretty and pretty partly because of the drought i think it's gonna set us up for some really nice fall colors because it concentrates stuff in the leaves so when it finally does start getting a little bit cooler the days start getting shorter the leaves start sealing themselves off on their twigs the green chlorophyll gets used up we can start seeing i think some really really pretty fall colors uh, I brought some stuff in to talk about, some little show and tell, some flowers, and, uh, one of my favorite wildflowers, and a good cut flower, and old-fashioned pass-along heirloom plant, and so, and one that we just simply take for granted. Uh, but it's not about me, it's about y'all. So if you've got some things you'd like to chat about, uh, anything related to gardening, lawns, trees, shrubs, flowers, vegetables, potted plants, herbs, anything, the only two things I do not talk about is Edible mushrooms, because if one person hears me wrong, uh, they're not good. And I also don't talk about the medicinal use of herbs, because I'm not a medical doctor. You can call in the folks uh, on our medical programs here and talk about that uh, with somebody who really knows their stuff. Otherwise, it's just anecdotal, and I don't want to mess with anybody's health. But anyway, you want know, to give us a call. It's toll-free, one eight seven seven mpb ring Got the phones open, and we're going to start out in Jackson talking with Jim. Hey, Jim, good morning. Good morning, Felder. Jim Rosenblatt here. How are you? Doing fine. Say, um, I've seen caterpillars on my pepper plants lately, and they're eating up the leaves pretty bad. But yeah. Because they might turn into butterflies, I've just let them go. Yeah, butterflies or moths, either way. You know, as long as the plant's got some green leaves on it and putting on new growth, caterpillars are usually kind of temporary. Uh, so, you know, you can maybe leave some and, and get rid of some. As long as it got plenty of leaves on it, it's not that big a deal. Really, really not. I figure that's my sacrifice for nature. Yeah, well, you know, it's if we all got to give and take a little bit, don't we? <laughs> Thank you, Felder. You bet. Good to hear from you. All righty, folks. Uh, I've mentioned something about the State Fair. Here's the deal. I checked with the Department of, uh, of Agriculture and Commerce. And uh, they said that as of right now, the state fair is on. You know, they're going to do the social distancing thing. And I don't know how they're going to do that when you have to, to line up so close to each other to get those biscuits and, you know, the, the free biscuits that's put out by the Department of Agriculture um, and that uh, ho- homemade uh, syrup but uh, and the, the corn and all that. But anyway, they said this could be opening. And the reason that's important to me is because here in Mississippi, Halfway through the state fair, it starts out hot. Everybody's wearing shorts. Everybody's, you know, got their, their, their stomachs hanging out. But halfway through, it turns cool, and they start wearing jackets and sweaters and, and huddling together. And so the state fair, to me, ushers in cool weather. And I know there's still a couple of months off, but when I start seeing falling leaves and I start hearing about the state fair, I start thinking about cool weather. And uh, I'm actually planning ahead for it. It, uh, I've got some things that I cleared out, out in my little little vegetable garden. I got a raised bed garden I did this spring and had corn and beans and squash and and uh, climbing peas and sweet potatoes. And then yesterday I cleared it all off except for the sweet potatoes. Got a good soaking rain on it. So sometime over the weekend I'm gonna turn that dirt over like chocolate cake and I'm gonna start planting stuff for fall. Maybe some broccoli or some carrots or something like that. But anyway, uh, gardening is not like farming. As soon as something's cleared off. As soon as you catch your breath, get out there before the mosquitoes know you're there, before the humidity slaps you too hard, and plant something else. A little at a time, and uh, that's how you get it done. Hey, let's go up to Startville and talk with Shirley. Hey, Shirley, good morning. Hi, Felder. How are you? Thanks for your program. Sure. I'm good, I'm good sequestered and uh, masked up when I go out. Uh-huh, me um, too. Okay, so... This year I made what I call an armchair garden. Uh-huh. So 
instead of having a dedicated garden spot, I uh, planted my uh, vegetables and strawberries in my uh, flower bed. Yeah, that's what I do. That's what I do. Oh, okay. Yes. So here's the thing, though. Something has been munching on my the leaves of my lima bean plant and on my cabbage plant. I mean, I was waiting for my cabbages to head. I have only four of them. And bless the lamb, I went back out. Uh, the, the outside leaves were beautiful and green. In fact, they looked almost like birds. But I was waiting, you know, for the head to form. All right. And about three days later, I went back out, and something had just eaten through all of those outside, um, you know, leaves. Yeah, yeah. And I can never catch the culprit. <laughs> well, let, let me ask you a couple of things. First of all, did it eat, like, holes right through it, or did they just chew through the whole thing? No, no, I eat the holes. The, the yeah. leaves look like lake. Look, yeah. The leaves yeah. look like lake. We, we, okay. we, we have, uh, we, there are a lot of insects. Of course, you know, we are, I have possums eating my, you know, some of the stuff in my yard and birds and squirrels and all like that. But we have a lot of caterpillars, a lot of butterfly and moss lay eggs. Uh, and there's one, the, one of the most common on cabbage and, bro- and broccoli and those related things is called the cabbage white. The, the butterfly is white. It's a pretty little butterfly. It's white. It flutters around, lays oh. eggs. And, uh, and they're tiny. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's the size of a, bigger than a quarter. You know, some, you know, smallish butterfly. Anyway, okay, it's, I've it's, seen something like that. It's real common. Oh, and th- they lay the smallest little eggs. You can barely see them on, the, usually the underside of the leaves. And they turn into these green caterpillars that eat their way right through these plants. And there's only really a couple of things you can do that are practical. Uh, there is a spray you can use that's safe. It's actually all natural. It's a, it's a, it's a bacteria that only controls caterpillars. Uh, and it's sold as BT, which is short for its Latin name. Uh, but anyway, it, it's, it's called uh, uh, biological worm spray. You put it on your plants. As soon as they bite it, they stop feeding. And that does a real good job. And if a bird comes along and eats a caterpillar, it's not poison. And that works. The other thing, and what they do in a lot of gardens where, where this is a problem, and I do it in my own garden, is just simply get some netting. And, you know, when you make a little thing, put you some bamboo stakes or something, little bottles at the top to where it doesn't tear, and just drape this uh, bird netting or insect netting over the whole thing. And and that works. And it's kind of weird looking. We're not used to it, but that's what people in England do. I mean, I go to a lot of a lot of gardens in England, and they all use this stuff because they say, you have to, don't you? And it's so, well, so preventative or else using the, the non-toxic biological worms. That's all we can do. Well, you know, I did the the natural things like uh, uh, planting marigolds. No, 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 no. no. I'm not trying to be uh, obstetrous here, but those don't work. They're they're pie in the sky. They work just enough for some people to swear by it, but in general, they're not effective. Not here in the acid test of the South. And by the way, marigolds have never controlled insects. That is a myth based on how they can control nematodes if you dig them into the dirt. They attract spider mites. Marigolds have zero effects realistically uh, on, on pre- preventing insects. Anyway, the companion plants are nice. They're pretty. Do it for that reason, uh, it, it, th- those kind of reasons, but netting or use the biological worm spray. The other thing is simply replant. The squash vine borers just went right through my squash this past spring. I turned right around and planted some more. And then I've uh, got the, I've got you, uh, and I've got them covered with nets. What do you think about neem oil? Uh, I I bought some of that in seven dust. Seven dust is a stomach poison. It's a chemical that uh and it's uh, as far as those go it's it's mild. Um but it only controls chewing type insects, and you have to get it where the insects are, and they've got to eat it, and they keep on eating until they drop dead. So if you're going to use something against caterpillars, I'd go with the biological worm spray because it's effective real fast. It's real, real safe. But uh, the other insecticides, you've got to get good coverage. You've got to get it where the bugs are, which usually means the underside of the leaves. And it's, it's hard, to, hard to get dust on the bottom of the leaf. It does no good on the top. So, where can I you know, get the BT? Most garden centers have it. 
Most garden okay. center. And uh, I mean, if you can't, you can get it in three days on Amazon at the local folk. But they they can get their normal supply. It's a com. It's a it's an old product, been around a long time. It's just called biological worm spray, and the active ingredient is a bacteria. It starts with B, and the other word starts with the T. But they, they'll know what you're talking about. Wonderful. By the way, my my uh, grape tomatoes are profusa, and my lettuce. I've made three salads out of that, and my cucumbers. And my better boy tomatoes Good. all did well. Good. I cut my tomatoes back this week because they're getting long and leggy, and I cut them back and like a bush, and they spr- sprout back in. Let me throw out one other thing. It's hard to grow lettuce, broccoli, cabbage, what we call cool season vegetables in the summertime here. So I think if you were to replant some cabbage and some things like that over the next month or so, you know, up until middle okay. later, later September, they'll actually produce better in the cooler days of fall than do in the hot summertime. But while you're there, get your net, get you a bird net. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, Father. You bet. Good to hear from you, Shirley. Stay safe. Okay, and I, I hate to come across so strong about the uh, companion plants, but a lot of companion planting stuff is based on anecdotal information a lot of times from New England or California or someplace like that. A lot of times they you know we there's not there hasn't been any real hardcore research on what's truly effective here in the deep south, which is the acid test for insects and diseases. But marigolds will control nematodes if you grow them one year, dig them in your dirt the next year, they're not gonna prevent anything else. Sorry, sorry. That's the truth. Anyway, if you want to give uh, uh, me a call and talk about your garden, we've got some uh, several folks on the line. And uh, when we're to come back and talk more about your garden, I also have one of my all-time favorite plants, the easiest plant from seed. It's a good cut flower. It's a great butterfly plant. It's a good pollinator plant. It's beautiful. Kids can grow it. You just throw the seeds on top of the dirt, and they come up, and they bloom. It's called zinnia. And the Latin name for zinnia, by the way, is zinnia. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart. The original Southern Remedy is available as a podcast. Subscribe using your favorite podcasting app. You can email a question to remedy at mpbonline.org. The doctor is always in on the original Southern Remedy. No matter if you use an app to start your car or still have a flip phone, Everyday Tech can decipher today's technology for tomorrow's solutions. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or the MPB public media app. All righty, folks, welcome back. Horticulture's fell to rushing. Uh, the zinnias I'm talking about, the plain old state fair, you throw a packet, don't have to plant them, you throw them on top of the ground and wet them down two or three times the first week, and you will have good cut flowers covered with butterflies. It's a magical thing for kids. And we've got time for those to do. So if you've got some kids, want them to start something uh, right away, a package of sunflower seeds. Just throw them on top of the ground, wet them down two or three times the first week, and then they'll have something really fun to look forward to. Hey, let's go. uh, Let's talk to, I think it's pronounced Kunzella calling from, is it Anchorage you're calling from? Hello. Hello. Hi, are you calling from Anchorage, Alaska? Sí. Okay, well, welcome. I've got a really good friend who writes for the uh, for the newspaper there named Jeff Lowenfels. He's a garden writer, does a, a radio program like mine. Sí. I'm trying to find some something to put on my tomatoes um, because I've did it for the first time in my life, and I have something green on there with some a lot of legs, and I don't know what that is. How to kill that thing on there? Is it a pretty pretty good size thing, like the size of your little finger? No, as bigger than my little finger. It's big, big, and long, long, and it has lots of like things on them. Yeah, that would probably be, be what they call the tomato hornworm. It's a larvae of a big moth that flies at night. And uh, you can spray stuff on them, uh, this biological worm spray. I was talking to an earlier caller. It works really, really well. But the easiest thing to do is put on a pair of gloves, and when you see one, they don't bite, they don't sting. Just pick it up and put throw it over the fence. Put on some gloves and me put on some gloves and, 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 and get that thing off of they, they don't bite. They don't sting. They're just caterpillars. Of, they're, they're the larvae of butterflies, and they cannot bite. They cannot sting. Just pull them and throw them over the fence. And they, and they, they, a bird will get them before they get back to the to the plants, uh, but that's the quickest, most effective way. And um, or if you got a kid in the neighborhood, you know, give them a, a nickel, give them five p to pull them off. 
<laughs> no, you can't give a kid a nickel this day and time and tell him to do something. You see, you have to give him five dollars to, to, to do something like that. I understand, but anyway, the 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 only spray that's really effective on something that big is not a poison to people or to pets or, or wildlife. It's a biological worm spray, and all, most of the garden centers sell it. It works quickly on caterpillars. It makes them stop feeding, and they drop off and and, and disappear. But okay, uh, I will go there when they open. I will go there and get some. And but, yeah, and, the time. and, and by, by the way, if you get a chance, uh, spin the dial up there. Uh, I've got a really good friend named Jeff Lowenfels. He writes for the uh, the Angry's newspaper, and uh, he has a, a gardening program. It's the longest running gardening radio program in the country. He's a really fun guy. I know Jeff. Okay. I know Jeff. Well, tell, and I thank you so much, okay? I'm going to go and find something to kill these things with these legs on them. I don't uh, I don't like them. Well, I'll, do me a favor. When Jeff's program comes on, call him up and tell him I said, hey. All righty. She's gone. Anchorage, Alaska. They're like uh, three hours or so behind us, so she's just not getting And I did want to tell her this, but it's almost September. Tom- tomatoes are, are gone at the end of August. They've got like a, a four-and-a-half-month growing season there in Anchorage. Uh, Jeff was a guy who told me years ago on this program that in the wintertime they take uh, green spray paint and they mix it up. I mean, not green spray paint, green food coloring, put it in water and spray the the snow over their shrubs so they have what look like green shrubs. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's let's go up to Oxford to talk with Bruce. Hey, Bruce, how are you? Good morning, Belder. What's My up? My question is regarding camellias of Japonica. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they have been sort of anemic looking, um, not bright green. They yeah. drop in the leaves. Here four, they have done wonderful. How, 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 old are, how long have they been there? Uh, about six years, yeah. seven years. Yeah. Uh, a, cu- a couple of things. You know, if uh, is it overall or is just a few here and there? Well, I've uh, the leaves. One. I'm talking and about the the leaves overall, or just a few here and there. Here and there, eventually they they have all fallen. As I say, yeah. I lost one. They completely defoliated. Yeah. And uh, I put. I've been reading on it. Of course, I put coffee grounds for acidity. And then I put uh, magnesium sulfate, which I had read uh, would help this kind of condition, but I don't see much improvement. Well, here, here's a couple of things. First of all, when when the overall plant looks kind of anemic, you know, not likely to be an insect or disease. We can pretty well rule those out. It's going to be a trunk or a root problem almost always. You know, if we can rule out having been hit, uh, you know, with the lawnmower or the string trimmer or something, if we can rule out some obvious, uh, you know, tr- trunk injury, it's going to be a root problem. Uh, and that could be anywhere from staying too wet part of the year, which causes the deep roots to rot, to really too dry. Or when you first set it out, you may not have loosened the potting soil up, the roots in it, and it's just got a ball of roots in a socket where all the potting soil is decomposed and most of the roots are concentrated right there. Uh, it, it's really important when you set a plant out to loosen the roots up so they get out into your dirt instead of just pulling out of the pot and sticking in the dirt, which causes long-term problems. So um, I would suggest rather than a fertilizer issue, which the magnesium would help with, a little fertilizer would help with, uh, it's more likely to be a general root struggling type of problem, too wet part of the year, too dry part of the year. Um, also, in, in one other thing, it's possible when you, a lot of people plant shrubs just a couple of inches too deep. That can stun them for life. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm shooting for some kind of general root problems, what I'm getting at. What you might want to try is go out from the, from the trunk, if you can remember how big the original hole was, and kind of gently, don't dig it up, but gently loosen the dirt outside the original hole to, so, to help roots get out there, and then pile some dirt on top of the original root ball so that dirt can melt and, and filter and settle down and fill in the spaces that the original potting soil had, and it's long gone because it, it decomposed. In other words, put some dirt around the base to fill in the gaps around the original roots and help the new roots get further out. And hope it doesn't stay too wet part of the year. That's about all you can do. A little bit of fertilizer, um, you know, not much. An occasional soaking during dry spells, but once they get established, they don't need much. They really don't. Yeah. So, Well, this is why it's concerning because, as I say, they're six, seven years old. Yeah. 
until recently they have been doing that fabulous. And I, I guess one of the questions regarding roots, with voles or moles? No, yeah, yeah, but they, they'll kill the plant. You know, it's not going to be a few leaves here and there. When You know, when the roots are, are just killed, the, the plant, the, the typical thing of, of destruction, root destruction, is the plants turn brown and stick on. If they're just turning yellow and falling off, that's a general stress, probably. And again, it could have stayed too wet back in the spring. They put on a whole bunch of growth when the growing was good. It gets hot and dry, and all of a sudden they got more top than their roots can take care of when the going gets tough, and so they generally shed those things. One other thing you can do, uh, and this is a common thing horticulturists do all the time, is cut it back. You know, cut it back so that it take all the stress off the root and it sprouts out strong new growth is better balanced with the roots. You know, and all these things, they, they work together. They work. So uh, think about too wet, too dry. Uh, think about um, uh, maybe the plants were just big to be, their roots just never had a chance to catch up and they put on a lot of growth that they can't sustain later in the summer, and which means pruning. Okay. Thank it's you not, very much. It's not fun, but it works. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, good luck on it. All righty. Love my zinnias I brought in today. Love my this uh, this fall, this first autumn leaf I've noticed on the sweet gum. Uh, let's go uh, down to McGee. Hey, Alex, thank you for calling. Hey, good morning, Felder. Uh, I just got a question real quick about the trumpet flower or creeping trumpet vine. Uh-huh. Uh, about 12 years ago is when I first moved to Mississippi. I kept seeing this one. Um, growing on the side of the road every about this time of year and it's in full bloom. And I finally uh, grabbed me a piece of it and planted it. And that was, like I said, about 12 years ago. Fast forward to now, and it's um, it's really big. It's uh, got four or five main vines that are about as big a run as your forearm. Yeah. Um, it, it's wonderful for um, all the all the animals and the bees and stuff. They're, I mean, they're just constant, like flies and bees. and Oh, hummingbirds yeah. That, H- hummingbirds yeah. almost crawl up in them. Yeah, they 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 fight over it and all that. But my thing was, I wanted to get you to talk about was um, the invasiveness of it. They drop off the beans and yeah. um, they've actually dropped all in between our porches and all around the area. Oh yeah, they, they and the roots also go like up under all around the ground, and you almost can't. It's almost like really really bad, and it's almost like not worth it. You know, yeah. because it's a uh, benefit. Uh, I, I actually have two like that. I've got uh, the, the the trumpet vine, but I also have one called cross vine that looks sort of like that, but it's sort of a reddish orange uh, in the springtime. Both of them are native. Both of them grow really well. They they like it here. They were here first. They you know they're just doing their thing. Uh, but I have both of mine to where I can walk around them. I've got uh, my my trumpet vine is on an iron post, fourteen foot iron I beam in three feet of concrete. I mean it's a it's like an arbor. And in the winter time when all those leaves fall off, those this year's twigs are white. So it's like having a big white. Uh, umbrella ribs out there uh, but when they pop up in other places i just simply pull them up sometimes uh, if if i need to if it's uh, hard to pull it keeps coming back i'll squirt it with a little roundup but uh in general and this is really uh, philosophically a native plant can't really be invasive because it was here first now you bring in kudzu from asia it's not from here it invades but Trumpet vine is just doing what oak trees and all these other native plants. It's just spreading because it likes it here. But yeah. Yeah, but you're right, you know. Once you and somebody said, well, you can you can cut you know you can cut the roots, just cut straight down. And what they didn't take into consideration that every time you cut a root, a new plant sprouts up right there. <laughs> so, yeah, it does. In between the cracks of our porch, like every single crack has one trying to make its way up to the lights, you know, and it's, it's oh, you know, it's everywhere. Yeah, and it, it'll it. it'll take the siding and your roof off there. If it gets up under the siding of your house, it'll pop that off. It's you know, it's a, it's a vigorous native vine. But uh, you know, like I say, sometimes as we say, some of these things can get away from you, and you just yeah, got to stay on top of uh, ch- okay, uh, no, chopping no. and pulling and squirting with Roundup. That's all we can do. But anyway, what Thank a great you. plant. Yeah, thank you, sir. It's beautiful, and like I said, it's tra- I'm sitting here watching it now, and there's there's all kind there's butterflies and hummingbirds and bees all over it right now. Okay, okay. thank you. Well, you just love it. You know, kids can be this way too. <laughs> Have a good day. <laughs> okay, Carter. appreciate Bye. it. All righty, folks. Uh, we're going to take a little short break. we got some lines open if you want to give us a call. It's toll-free 1-877-MPB-RING. I want to set up this tune real quick. Uh, 1970 in May, I graduated from high school, and this song came out, and it shot up the charts. 
and it's got one of the most evocative steel guitar songs. It's a rock song, but it has a steel guitar, and I found out just this past week that the person who played it who died 25 years ago this week, was hired by this band to play the steel guitar in return for this band teaching him, his band, how to sing harmonics. So it's a harmonic song with a steel guitar by a classic rock icon who passed away 25 years ago this week. Anyway, relax. Breathe in, breathe out. This is one of my life mantras, this song is. I'm a horticulturist, Felder Rushing. Me and Java, Liz Gill, and all the folks here at MPB. We'll be back right after this with your phone calls. children teach your parents they let them feed on your dreams that steel guitar the iconic steel guitar for that tune and again it came out uh in uh in may 1970 is one of my, my my life's anthems steel guitarist agreed to play that song for crosby stills nash and young in return for them teaching his band how to sing harmonies his band was called the grateful dead and that was jerry garcia who played the steel guitar and the only reason he played that was because he wanted Crossfield Nash Young to teach the Grateful Dead how to sing together. Isn't that weird? Isn't that weird? Anyway, he passed away 25 years ago. Great, great songer. Back to gardening, though. Let's uh, start out in Picayune talking with Barbara. Hey, Barbara, what's going on down that close to Louisiana? Well, a lot of rain. <laughs> well, which is sort of nice, sort of nice, but we might get a little bit more. Well, I know. It is nice because I had sod put down Saturday, and, and I don't have to water it for a while. So. Uh, you know, and by the way, you don't have to water it as much as they told you you to. I'm, you know, I've, I've studied turf management at Mississippi State, and I've been working with this for 40-something years. They say to water like every day or two. The grass wants a good soaking 
once or twice a week for the first three or four weeks. Yeah, well, I don't think that'll be a problem right now with no. all this rain. But well, thank when, but when it when it stops raining, don't water it all the time. You want to te- you want to tease those roots down deep, and you do that by putting the water down deep, and then letting the sod dry out for a day or two. It yeah. will it will do better. It'll have a deeper root system. So don't water as often. So anyway, uh, what you calling about? Well, I'm calling about. I put two U's in my landscape: the low kind, the low spreading. Mm-hmm. On the suggestion of Mark Pastorek that I found out about. From your program. Oh, so, Mark. Mark, the wildflower guy, the meadow guy. Yeah, but anyway, he put out a landscape plan for me. Mm-hmm. And one, they've been, the ewes have been doing beautifully. And I went down to that end of my property yesterday, and one of them, they're close together, maybe five feet apart. One of them is all turning brown at the top in the mm-hmm. crown. Hmm. A uh, cu- couple of things. Uh, plum U is a really good plant. Once it gets established, it's really, really durable. It needs no care at all. He, it's a good choice. And this is, I'm assuming it's in the, the light shade, right? Yes. Okay, good. Um, if you keep it a little too wet or if it stays if it stays dry a little bit too long, both of the, each, either of those cause root damage that may take weeks to show up. So uh, it and and also in a, as I mentioned to a fellow who was talking about camellias earlier, when I set things in the ground, I always dig a wide hole and I always loosen up the potting soil and some of the roots, so that it's not growing in potting soil in a hole in the ground. And uh, but that that causes stay too wet, too dry, too wet, too dry, back and forth and back and forth. So, uh, how long have these been in the ground? They've been in the ground for years now. You okay, know. if they've been in there for a long time, then I'm gonna have to assume that that the one that's not doing well it either stays a little wetter than the other in the spring. You know, when it rains a lot, which means it'll have more shallow roots and more susceptible to hot, dry weather a little bit later. Uh, about the only thing I can recommend, seriously, would be to to prune it back. And it sounds or wait for wait to prune it. Uh, you, you know, that, that close to the coast, you could go ahead and do it now. We usually say the middle of August is sort of the cutoff date for hard pruning to give plants time for new growth to come out and tough up, toughen up before fall. But if you cut it back, that'll take the immediate stress off and it'll stimulate some new growth. It may, it may take a month to come out, but it, it's got plenty of time to toughen up before winter. Okay, uh, one other thing. Um, I have some um, buckeye that Mark gave me as well, mm-hmm. and and they put off, well, only, I've got three of them, but only one of them had blossoms the past couple of years, uh-huh. but now they're turning brown. Okay, this is kind of normal, but buckeye, uh, and I'm assuming these are in the shade. they got to have shade. Yeah, they are. Okay. Uh, Buckeyes are one of the first trees. It's a nice, nice small tree. One of the first to lose its leaves in the late summer and fall. It's one of the first. Mine, uh, usually when when other stuff is just showing its fall colors, mine have no leaves left. So they, they tend to defoliate pretty early. Okay. Now, can I prune those? Can I keep I, them at sort of a... The, a certain height if I want to? or Well, you, you could, but rather than treat them like a shrub, thin out, just thin a few limbs here and there. In other words, keep their kind of a natural, small, open tree shape. Uh, I wouldn't prune them hard because, you know, they're spring bloomers, and they may not have time for... To, actually, they're late winter bloomers. They're the first flower that hummingbirds flock to when they come back you know, in the late winter. So I would just thin out any branches that are, or limbs that are getting too tall or wayward and just sort of leave that, that loose, informal, small tree shape. All they're right. they're understory you. trees. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, appreciate it, Barbara. Hey, next time you see Mark, tell him I said hey. Well, I haven't seen him now in a couple of years. He's doing consulting primarily. He doesn't do any... Yeah, I I saw him at a, a native plant meeting back uh, last fall. But anyway, appreciate your call, Barbara. All right, thank you. Bye bye. Okay, let's slide up to Central Mississippi to Brandon. Hey, Richard. Hello, Richard. Oh, sorry, you said Brandon, and I'm over in Raymond. My apologies. Oh, okay. Well, um, <laughs> no worries. I was thinking you had somebody else you're going to. No, so. it it said anyway. Anyway, Liz. No worries. You know, whatever. Good morning. Good morning. So uh, I just bought a new home, and they have some very beautiful knockout roses planted all around the place. Mm, they went nuts. They went nuts. Yes, they did. They've got them everywhere. 
but I'm having an issue with Virginia creeper and poison ivy getting mm. into them. Mm-hmm. And it turns out my wife is allergic to both of these, so she doesn't really have, doesn't have the ability to get in the flower bed yeah. and work with it without breaking out in poison ivy rash. And I'm working a lot of hours. Yeah. So I was trying to figure out if you had a recommendation on how I could get rid of Virginia creeper and poison ivy without <laughs> adversely affecting the roses and the other shrubbery in the area. There, there is uh, there it, there are only two solutions, and only one really works. The one that doesn't work well is have somebody get up under there with some gloves and just pull it up as best you can. Just pull it up. And that's not acceptable to most people. By the way, she's probably not allergic to Virginia creeper, but it grows so closely. It's native, just like the, that it's hard to find Virginia creeper that doesn't have poison ivy in with it. Uh, but anyway, pulling it up is is one option, and that's the 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 PC way, I guess. The most effective way, and I usually catch flack when I say this, but I'm I'm very thoughtful about this. I'm researched back. Would be to cut it down close to the ground. What's up in the plants will die, and what's left on the ground will sprout back out. When it sprouts back out, pretty good. Just hit it with a core spray of Roundup. Roundup only kills what you get it on the leaves of, which means if you don't get it on your roses, it won't kill the root, won't kill them through the roots. Uh, you you could brush it, you could mop it, you could use a core spray, you could use a shield, whatever. But if you get it on a small plant, it goes into the plant, kills the roots, and the plant dies once and for all. It won't come back because it's dead. And I've done this many times. As long as you don't bathe in it and don't use it year after year after year after year, it has the same likelihood of causing you problems as red meat or fried food. Well, that's fine. I, I, I was 100% okay with Roundup. I grew up using it. I just wanted to make sure that it, I've never known that it went through the leaves. I was afraid it, of killing everything no, else around. It, it's only absorbed through green tissue. And once it hits the dirt, it tightly binds, and then it degrades in carbohydrates. So it's only absorbed through leaves. And the shorter distance it has to get from the leaves to the roots, the better it works. And so, again, sometime over the winter, when the, when the plants have, when the, when the roses have dropped all their leaves, if you'll go in and just don't pull it up, just cut it all down, you know, it's close to the ground, except for the roses. In the spring, when the when the round, when the, the 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 vines first sprout out, then they're actively growing, and they get four, five, six. When they're starting to grow pretty good, just brush the roundup on it, and it as long as you don't get it on the leaves of the roses, it will not affect them at all. All right. Well, that yeah. is great, and I thank you for your time and help. All right. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. I always get emails about that, but I'm having to stick with the facts, folks. I'm having to stick with the facts. And uh, as far as safe and effective, that's my best bet. I wish I could say something different, but that's my best bet. Hey, let's slide over to Meridian. Hey, Angela, how are you this morning? I'm well, thank you. Good. What's up? Uh, okay, my dad lives in western Nebraska, and he sent me a few rhizomes of my grand's irises and some horseradish. Yeah. That's been on his place since probably 1900. Um, and I'm going to uh, prepare most of it, you know, for sauce. Right. But Dad was like, take one of your roots, cut it into chunks. And plant. plant the, you know, the narrow yeah. end down. Mm-hmm. But I had heard you earlier in the year say that horseradish wouldn't really work here. So it, I just wanted to call back and find out. It, it doesn't It doesn't like it here. Same with rhubarb. You know, horseradish, rhubarb, you know, they like a long, cold, miserable, horrible winter. Nebraska winter. Which we don't have. <laughs> uh, so you almost have to treat it like an annual, you know. Oh, okay. Uh, and so, so, you know, you have a good chance. Now, I don't remember the details about horseradish. I've never grown it myself because, to be honest, one of the reasons I don't like Bloody Marys in New Orleans because they put horseradish in it, you know, and I'm not a horseradish <laughs> kind of guy. But uh, – I don't remember if it's best to plant it in the fall or spring. I just don't remember. I can find out for you because I've got a good source on southern, uh, on trying to grow northern and midwestern plants in the south. So if you want to drop me an email, I can help you with that. But uh, okay. in general, but if you want to Google it yourself, look for horseradish in Georgia or horseradish in Texas or, or you know, pick a, a southern state. Okay. And and see what but I don't. I, I just don't remember. I, I want to say you have you ought to plant in the fall, which is coming up. Right. Okay. Hey, let me ask you this. You are you from Western Nebraska? My dad is. Have you been uh, out there lately? Yes, I have. <laughs> have you ever been to Carhenge? 
Oh, yes, I have. Ah, so I'm not making this up. You've seen no. it, too. It's, I mean, you got to be going there. It is on a rural highway in the middle of nowhere, right under the shadows of the mountains. Yeah, in Alliance, Nebraska, where my gran of the irises and my grandfather uh, eloped. Wow. But, in uh, a horse and buggy. And, well, this, this fella did a complete... Authentic car uh, Stonehenge using cars yep. painted gray, and I've been there. Gray. And, yeah. and I also saw some irises not far from there up in the mountains in a cemetery. So we know irises, d- dead people can grow those things. <laughs> but, but, but here in the south, plant the irises almost on top of the ground where the top part of the rise room is baking in the sun. Okay. And if you cover them up, uh, if you plant them like you would anything else, they're not likely to bloom. So put them on top of the ground and stomp on them and walk away. And and um, what about full sun? Because they're yeah. um, growing on the eastern side of his house. Yeah, they, you know, iris is knee sun to bloom well, but here, you know, the, as long as it's not real dense shade, they'll do fine. But sun or oh, shade, okay. if you plant them in the sun, they get a bunch of weeds. But as long as it gets, you know, a few hours of sunshine, they'll do fine. The most important thing is have that root, that rhizome, the top right, part sticking top out of the ground. Oil. Okay. But you've been to Car Hinge. I'm not making this up. I have. Yeah. <laughs> and on that same highway recently, well, within the last 10 years, some guy uh, built a giant, he took a recliner and, like, built a giant outhouse. <laughs> have you ever heard of Roadside America? <laughs> no. Okay, go online, roadsideamerica.com, and click on Nebraska and see if that's on there. <laughs> because you can click on any state, and it shows you the weird stuff in the state. Anyway, yeah, well, thanks. you know, there's not a lot of people out there, so they got to have something to keep themselves alive. A lot, <laughs> lot of corn, a lot of corn out there. A lot of corn and cattle, wheat. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, right, Angela, well, good luck on it. Let, let's know thanks how so it much. works. See I ya. will. Thank you. Bye. Car hinge. Been there. It's a stone he has made out of cars. By the way, before we uh, uh, finish up with some calls after this real, real short break, let me mention this. This past week, you know, back in the spring, uh, a friend called me up and, and uh, let me rescue a baby possum. Little, it wasn't as big as my fist, little bitty thing. Could barely stand up. And I've kept it. I kept it in a big cage. Then I moved it to the cage. It's got things. I put it inside. I built a big box for it. I gave him something to climb on. I've got him where he could do his own thing. I named him Pogo. And this past week, I set Pogo free. He wandered off into the dark, waddled off in the dark. America's only marsupial with a pouch, prehistoric, more t- it's just the most fascinating creature, can hang by their tails. Anyway, Pogo has been set free, and we'll post a picture of baby Pogo uh, on our uh, the podcast for today. I'm Horticulture's Felder Rushing, me and Java, Liz Gill. We're going to take a real quick break and come right back. Hi, I'm Walt Grayson. You can now listen to the wild, weird, and wonderful stories of Mississippi with Mile Marker. Slowly we started, you know, picking these turtles up and saving them. I'll stop traffic, grab one out of the road. And then our friends found out and our vet would call us. Join me as we hit the roads of Mississippi on Mile Marker. We are now a full-fledged, nonprofit turtle rescue. You can listen by going to mpbonline.org slash radio or by using your favorite podcasting app. Mile Marker, a Mississippi Roads podcast. All right, folks, welcome back. Horticulture's Fellow Rushing. I've already talked about the first fall leaves I found from the sweet gum tree, the wonderful cut flower zinnias. Well, let me talk about the heirloom perennial, southern heirloom perennial that's that looking knocked out in my yard. It's an old-fashioned plant. Some people call it purple cane. Some people call it purple heart. Uh, it's in the same family as uh, the potted plant we call wandering Jew, but it's got long uh, I'm going to say banana, uh, not quite, small banana-shaped leaves, as purple as they can be with the cutest little pink flower on the end of it. Uh, Latin name is Setcresia purpurea. Anyway, it's a great old hardy perennial, sun or shade. It's just a terrific old pass-along plant uh, that makes a spreading ground cover wonderful up under my roses because it doesn't take a lot of moisture away from the roses. Anyway, purple heart or purple cane, Secrecia purpurea, and the last one is my monkey grass. My, I say liriope. Some people say liriope. Some people say lirio, but we all agree it's called striped monkey grass. It's got foot long spikes of the most beautiful lavender cut flowers right now. I grow it not as a ground cover, but as individual plants in pots and here and there, and it's got wonderful lavender, strong, long stem cut flowers right now. Plain old 
striped monkey grass. Uh, let's go down to Soche and talk with Elmer. Hey, Elmer, thank you for calling. Good morning, Felder. What's up? My Confederate rose don't bloom. It bloomed the first year. Uh-huh. Two of them. I got two big ones, about eight, ten foot tall. A lot of stems. Yeah. It doesn't bloom at all? It hasn't bloomed this year at all. Okay, let's let's try something that's going to sound weird. And people who, who don't know me, who may have stumbled on this program by accident, aren't going to understand that what I'm about to say is based on plant physiology, but it sounds country. Take a stick to it. Go out there and just whoop on it. Don't break it. Just whoop on it. Or take some of the branches and bend them over almost to where they break, but don't break. Let them snap back up into place. What this does is it stresses a plant and causes the release of a hormone called traumatin that will kick a plant into flowering. Uh, have, wow. you ever, have you ever heard of, of uh, switching okra? No. Well, a lot of people take a stick to the okra when it starts producing. They just beat on it, and it causes it to sprout out flowers. It releases a hormone called traumatin. But uh, it's, it's early. These things usually don't bloom till uh, October or so. So you may still get some flowers, but go ahead and thin out a few of the stems, you know, so you don't have quite some. And by the way, this could be a yellow jacket nest in there, so be careful. But if you'll go ahead and cut some of the stems back, and then the ones that are left, bend them over to almost to where they break, and then let them pop back up into place. And a lot of times this stress will cause them to kick them into to, to making flowers, not making this up. And you're saying beat the stalks, the trunks? Yeah, yeah or anything that stresses it. An easier thing to do would be to, to, to grab it, you know, and, and follow it up to the top and then bend it over towards the ground, but not so far that it snaps. You know, bend it over till it stretches really good and almost feels like breaking, and then let loose and let it pop back up into place. This stressing is what causes the flowering hormone to be released. Well, and, you know what I, what's that? What I did. They were heavy with flowers the first year. Yeah. And I tied them up where they wouldn't be leaning over. Yeah, and you embarrassed it. Now it won't bloom again. You're gonna, you're gonna, now you're going to have to go beat it. Uh, and don't, let, don't tie them up? No. Nope. No. Nope. Because they were heavy, you know, and, and yeah. there's many stalks. There's maybe okay. four or five. What, what, what would you rather have, a pretty plant that doesn't bloom or a sprawly thing that's covered with flowers? <laughs> Yes, sir. Pretty, pretty flowers. <laughs> Go ahead and and, uh, and cut some of the, the stems back, you know, to about knee high, and the ones that are left, pull them over to almost to where they break, and let them loose. Let's see what happens. I got you. <laughs> okay, Elmer. Uh, well, hey, fertilizer. Just... Nah, these things they grow in cemetery. Dead people can grow these things. Yes, I got you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> good, okay. Thank you. Good luck on it. Yes, sir. You have a blessed day. Yeah, Java. Where do I come up with this kind of stuff? Where do I come up with this kind of stuff? Now, that was, like you said, very country sounding where you take a stick and just beat on it. Switch your okra. It's, Go down but, the stick and just beat on your okra. But you gave the science behind it. <laughs> and I can I can get behind that. <laughs> oh, me. Oh, Lordy. Folks, when I get off the air, I'm headed up uh, to the uh, Mississippi Department of Archives and History. The Mississippi Flag Commission is meeting again, and and uh, of all the people who submitted flag designs for for Mississippi's new flag, over three thousand of them, uh, they got them narrowed down to one hundred and forty something. There are those over ninety. Two out of three have got a magnolia flower on it, a magnolia. And so uh, I made a presentation to them last time the meet and said, you know, we're the magnolia state, Texas Lone Star State. South Carolina's a Palmetto State. We're the Magnolia State. We got Magnolia in our store. Let's put a Magnolia in our flag. You know, regardless of what you feel about a flag, folks, it's just some colorful strings on a stick. Colorful strings on a stick. Where everybody's got their own colorful strings on their own stick and they wave it around. But we're the Magnolia State. So I'm hoping that when they narrow it down to this last five, and then they narrow it down to one, that at least one of them. It's got a fighting chance of having a magnolia grandiflora, largest flower in North America, native to every county in Mississippi. Anyway, I got some zinnias, I got some purple cane, I got some monkey grass flowers, I got some some uh, uh, sweet gum leaves. I let my pogo possum go. We can have a picture on our podcast, but I'm about to go out and do some stuff this weekend that I love doing. I wish I had some kids at home still. Got a grandkid coming on the way, but if you got some kids in the neighborhood. 
Take them to a, to a garden center. Take them to a farmer's market. Get them a packet of seeds or a bulb or, or some, home, some locally grown tomatoes. Show kids, teach your children, and show them how to do what we do best. It's okay. Show them how to go out and get dirty. See you all next week. If you're a sustaining member of MPB Think Radio, we appreciate your support of our programs. To become a sustainer, go to mpbonline.org.